Welcome. Hello, my name is Julia Sprenger. My background is also from the neurosciences, so similar to Jan's. Can you hear me? No, I am muted. Wait. The video. So I have to. Okay. okay you Sorry. Have to speak up. Or you have to be more quiet, then it also works. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I'm also from the neurosciences, similar as Jan, but today I don't want to talk about our setup and our software we are using, but I, I hope that there are some of you in the audience who are doing software development but are not in the sciences yet. And I want to convince those of you to, that it's worth joining the software, open source software development in science right now and it's uh, something the science would benefit a lot from. <laughs> okay, so first I'm... I'm going to give you a bit of a background so we have a common understanding on how science works. So in general, of course, the sciences aim to understand certain systems better. So this might be something really tiny from individual molecules and how they fold to how the brain of a certain species works, uh, how Earth uh, climate is changing or where we are coming from and where we are going to, so the whole universe. And the method used for this is uh, that there's a scientific question at the beginning, then the hypothesis is formed. Uh, from this, a prediction is uh, yeah, formed, and this can be tested in an experiment. And at the end, there's a scientific finding, either confirming or uh, rejecting the hypothesis. And to communicate this to other scientists, the method of choice is to, to write a paper, so to publish a paper. Usually we're not done there, but there's a new scientific idea popping up and the whole circle starts from the beginning. Um, this is not the whole truth. So of course also science needs to think about money at some point. Um, so to actually be able to answer your scientific question, you need to have funding for your team. And uh, this can be funded by you writing a project proposal. This get, gets evaluated, and if uh, if the project proposal is good, then you get the funding. And of course, a big aspect in this um, proposal procedure is uh, the reputation also of the respective scientists. And for this, publications are the the currency in science, basically. Um, as you can see already, uh, I'm not mentioning software here yet. Of course, software is an important part, especially uh, like in the experimental part of, of this loop, but it's, it's not a key part. It also doesn't really play a big role in, uh, in the publication or in the reputation, at least not yet. Um, so differences to maybe software development in business or uh, in other uh, projects uh, compared to science. So in science, since the publication is the currency we are talking about. Uh, the, the people have usually a time issue in, in time they can invest for, for software development. And uh, this software development, if it is done, is typically also targeted directly at scientific outcomes, so at plots for paper publications and so on. So uh, there's not really time for developing extensive infrastructure uh, like the one once Jan presented in the previous uh, presentation, or for restructuring and refactoring your, your code to make it nicer and more maintainable in the future. Um, also, in science, when you study a certain scientific field, you might, might be an expert on that field, but you don't know anything about how to develop software. Um, so, meaning people going into science usually don't know about uh, best practices for code style, how to assure quality uh, of your code, version control is something completely new to most of them, uh, and how to validate your code in, in general and also with respect to previous publications, for example. Also, I mentioned it already, money is, uh, is an issue, so money needs to produce publications and uh, it's not usually available for sending your scientists to, to um, training courses how to do software development. Um, there's also not a lot of money, as Jan mentioned already, for having non-scientific uh, software developers in your lab uh, or having the infrastructure just to develop uh, software in your, in your lab, having your own 
um, continuous integration system running or something like that. Um, additionally to those three obvious ones, there's also a kind of a, a trust issue. So as a scientist, you tend to want to have control of your experiment or your setup. So for small questions, scientists tend to go for, oh, I'd rather implement this myself than have everything under my control and uh, I don't rely on external uh, tools or I don't use existing simulators for the question I want to ask. So, uh, but these small questions can then turn out, of course, to be huge projects and uh, yeah, need a lot of time and are poorly designed. Um, for complex projects, Jan also already mentioned that it's, it's likely that you get the funding to buy some software instead of hiring software developers who, who um, based on open source software, develop something specifically needed in your lab. Um, also relating to the, to the trust issue is, as I said, the publication is the most important currency. And so you work until you have the publication and maybe after this publication is out and accepted, maybe you release your code later. This is the, the classic way of how people think about it. Um, and since making errors is kind of a taboo in science, so everything published needs to be uh, safe and, and perfect in the best case because your reputation depends on it. The, the same also applies to software. So people tend not to publish their software because other people might find bugs in there. And this is then, of course, a problem. Um, yeah, some two publications I want to mention here to, to kind of demonstrate the opposite, that publishing code actually can also push the scientific progress is uh, one by Itzikiewicz who, who developed a, a model for um, yeah, in the neural simulations. Um, in 2006, at that time, publishing code was not known at all, uh, but he actually did it on his website, and this enabled uh, researchers nowadays to re-implement the same model and start uh, implementing the same model with modern techniques and also validating the scientific results. And at the same time, they also wrote a guide on what could have done better in the first implementation to make it more reproducible in the first place. So this is also helping the whole community now. Um, another issue is also the dedication. As I mentioned, software development is rather a side occupation. So whenever a, a paper deadline is coming, uh, software development is uh, stopped and the paper goes first. So there's no extended time reserved for software development. It's not like you can have like two weeks sprints in your, in your lab without being interrupted. Uh, so it's not a continuous task, but rather only mind. When you need a feature for generating a plot, you implement it, but then you go back to other issues. Um, and, and it has a rather low, uh, rather low um, priority. Uh, also, the quick changes of, of stuff in scientific labs makes it difficult. So as I said, people are not uh, educated from the, from the university side in software development. So whoever is coming to your lab needs to be educated in, in the best practices in your, in your lab already uh, still. And then typically people leave already. So it's, it's not like there's a lot of, of time for people to get into it. Um, there's also not a dedicated team only developing a certain part of software, but it's a lot of scientific projects. People are working on their project and wh whosoever project has an overlap with this particular software might contribute to that software a, a tiny bit, but it's not a team working on it by, def by definition. And yeah, maybe a difference to um, business software is that in, in science, usually the numeric precision is rather a, a high valued um, aspect of, of the software. Okay, so let me just quickly show you a couple of examples of uh, scientific software projects. So some you might recognize from Jan's presentation. So there's, of course, software projects on all scales in sciences. Uh, AutumnL tables is a rather tiny one. It's, uh, it's basically an add-on to the AutumnL open metadata markup language Jan presented. It's, uh, it's an interface to make this standard more usable and also in a laboratory environment. So, um, so this project is rather young, only a couple of years. There's only one developer. 
no contributors and uh, only a few users and one publication referencing to this. So basically, if this one developer decides to leave science, this project is done. So that it, yeah, nobody will take care of it anymore. Um, so this is a rather small project and um, I think most of the projects in science are on that scale. Of course, there's also bigger ones like uh, NEO. This is a kind of a standard representation for electrophysiology data sets. And uh, it's, a, it's an important uh, tool because it, it forms an interface between a, a large number of uh, yeah, formats for electrophysiology data and the corresponding software building on, on top of it. So for data visualization, um, analysis, and so on. And this one is already a bit older. Uh, it, it benefited from previous attempts to implement something similar. So there's already some knowledge going into this one. It's used in more than 100 repositories, has three developers in three labs. So meaning it's a bit more robust than the previous one uh, and has already a couple of users and has been presented at conferences and workshops. So this one is a bit more robust than one level higher even, there's uh, software on a scale like, a, like the Nest Simulator. So this is a community standard simulation tool uh, for spiking neural network models. And it scales from laptop applications to uh, supercomputing uh, facilities, so to exascale computers. And this one, as you can guess, is already has a longer history. It, started in 93 already and actually this piece of software is now not owned by individuals anymore uh, but there's an initiative owning this piece so uh, the responsibility for the software is rather uh, distributed there's uh, al also a number of developers in involved in here um, across different labs a uh, large number of contributors and it also has a dedicated website announcements tutorials videos so this I would consider rather robust piece of software which is um, solid, solidly founded in the, in the sciences and will be around for, for the next decades. And of course, just to mention the, the large players in this one you might recognize. So there's also bigger projects like the Yo Human Brain uh, is, is a project which is uh, generating infrastructure for the neurosciences, so also mainly software. And a, uh, a large number of this is also open source. Then uh, in the biology in general, the Open Worm project and for particle physics, uh, you might have heard of Root. Uh, but of course, as I mentioned, there's a large number of smaller projects which don't have this infrastructure available and are rather yeah, on, on the risky side when people leave, leave the sciences. So the question is now, uh, what can you do as a software developer for those rather small projects. So as I said, the problem is that uh, scientists usually don't know a lot about how software development is done, what tools can be used for this, what, how, what, what they should take care of. So, um, so first of all, if you want to get involved, the first thing is talk to scientists and see if what they are working on or the problems they have is are interesting to you and you might be able to contribute in just giving us really simple and small advice to them and making their life also much easier. Um, yeah, get involved in existing scientific projects and provide feedback. If you have experience in open source software development, just uh, make a comment, give some advice, be, be helpful. <laughs> um, if you have a project which might be interesting for scientists, make sure that you make it understandable for scientists. So uh, have, a, have an easy documentation or at least a, something like an installation for dummies because people might be experts in their scientific field but they don't know how to compile your software to install it. Um, and yeah, if you think that your particular piece of software might be interesting to a particular scientific community, attend conferences and maybe go to a workshop to create the link between the two. Um, so as a, from the perspective of a scientific software project, uh, as I said before, these smaller projects are endangered to 
basically die when people leave science. So if you want to prevent this to happen to your project, uh, it's better to involve a larger user base because with a larger user base, also a number of contributors might join your project and thus, thus keeping your project alive, even when you might leave science. Um, the same as before applies, so simplify the usage and contribution on all levels, so make it as easy as possible for other people to join, um, including the user and developer guide tutorials on how to use your particular piece of software. Uh, solve simple issues first, so don't start implementing the most complex analysis functions, but start with easy things people might look out for in, uh, in the first attempts of analysis, for example. Um, yeah, define project standards and contribution guides and advertise. This is uh, also the, one of the most important parts. <coughs> As a scientist, don't start implementing uh, stuff from scratch, but first have a look what is around, especially open source wise. And if you don't find anything, then you might start from scratch. But most likely there is something which might help you. Um, if you want to make sure your, your project is, is robust, there's a, the best practice coreinfrastructure.org website where you can register your software project and uh, have certain features that are checked how, how robust your, your project is, meaning how is the support, how many people are involved in it, uh, how is the documentation. Uh, create links to other packages because if other pack packages care about your software, it might be either integrated into that one in the long term or yeah, other people will feel responsible for it also, not only you. Um, yeah, and if you start from scratch, consider software development aspects from the beginning. So don't, st don't start just writing 1,000 lines of code uh, and uh, don't care about the structure behind it maybe, or version control. So as a, a summary now, uh, as a vision in the future, it would be awesome if this whole uh, scientific cycle from the prediction to the publication would also involve more the open source aspect of software development, um, including all of the nice uh, features that come from, from the agile development side, for example, like pair programming, path driven development, peer review should be used. Uh, and it should build, of course, on the large stack of open source software that is already available. Um, including also that open source software or software in general should be considered in project proposals, fundings, and uh, should also make a bigger deal of the uh, reputation of a particular scientist, his contribution to particular software pieces. Okay, with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Neuroscience, but I would take a guess that individual labs are developing their own tools um, in isolation, and the not invented here syndrome is probably quite strong. Um, what can you do within your community of neuroscience labs um, to perhaps get better coordination across, across that wider field? So, within the Oh, sorry. <laughs> so what, what can we do within a scientific community to, to make software more accessible also by other people in the community? No, no, or no. What can you do within your domain? Mm -hmm. Because I think it, doesn't, it needs to be within labs that are doing the same sorts of things. So they're the ones that have a natural, um, uh, um, natural benefit from cooperation. So... You mean besides going to to the particular conferences and uh, talking to people about there about your ideas or your solutions to this problem? Uh, can I give you an example? Yeah. Okay, I, I work on the energy system model. We, we have an umbrella network um, that looks at all these issues, um, and the, the, the one that, that 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 binds that community together is actually data. Yeah. We all use the same data. We all look at the same system. Um, and I don't know really whether it's appropriate for neuroscience, but why can't the labs get together and, and, and cooperate more? 
understand So also, I mean, I can I can only talk about the neurosciences because. <laughs> um, so also in the neurosciences, there's now, um, yeah, attempts to organize this in a in a more, yeah, at least German-wide fashion. Uh, so there's institutions being being founded for uh, collecting problems that are common to particular subfields, maybe, and then coordinating this and solving this in a more consistent manner. And I think without such institutions, it's this it's a really hard task to solve, but you need to recognize that these ones are necessary and need to get them funded, basically. That's the issue. Uh, yeah. Good question. Um, because it's related to neuroscience, like, for example, when somebody like Obama says that the, at least the United States pledge, uh, I think it's like one billion or a trillion, a lot of money to like this brain project, I, I realize that's in the United States, but in, in terms of like the scientific community, what does that mean to you in real terms? <laughs> you mean, yeah, it depends on what's the what's the aim behind this funding. So if if it goes into um, projects like this one, providing a uh, an infrastructure which is basically collecting common needs across the whole field and trying to solve them in a in a common manner or org coordinating basically these attempts, then it, it's awesome. I, I don't know what exactly the aim was behind this now. So I, I guess nothing of that has trickled down to you, I guess, or maybe it's somebody that you know in the US or? I'm, I mean, I'm not working in the US. <laughs> I'm not saying like a colleague in the same research field. Mm, I haven't heard anything directly, but that's just my personal experience. I, I can't make a general comment there. Maybe someone else can. Okay. I'm curious, what's your thoughts about like, like software publications? Yeah. One way of like, like if you can create scientific something in paper, then type it yeah. paper. Yeah, this is uh, getting, uh, so what's my opinion about software publication journals, basically? Um, so this is getting more common, and I think it's it's also a good way of kind of going around this only publications count issue, but uh, it's not the long-term solution because writing, a, I mean, papers have a, have a very different style of writing and may, you might provide some examples in a, in a publication, but it's still just, it's just a PDF which is aiming at showing people this software exists, go to the documentation and read about it, right? Uh, so it's the, the style is maybe not the best one, but for the purpose of getting publications and getting more software awareness into the sciences, I think for now it's a good, it's a good way. Yes. I I'm aware of it, but the I, the softwares I'm involved with, so also basically similar to the ones Jan talked about, uh, are not in there, I think, as, as far as I know. Yeah. Yes. Um, I, I face one big challenge, mostly with the science um, colleagues, and that is that they don't feel themselves as software developers, and that is why they don't do any of this. What is your opinion on that feeling that you get? So that scientists don't consider themselves to be like proper software developers and that's the reason why they don't really go into it. That's a, uh, that's a common issue and usually, so in my experience, it, it needs like one or two people in the lab who are more dedicated towards the software development side to, to pull more people in. If you don't have these people in your lab, it's really hard. Uh, then it, it basically won't, won't happen. If you're lucky, then it, then you have them and it works, but there's no, there's no general advice on how you can get people interested in software development who are not, I don't know, born for it. <laughs> yes.
so you mean to have a dedicated place where people more like software developers and scientists can can go together and uh, talk about problems so yeah I, myself i don't have um extended experience with this but it's it's a it's a really good uh, opportunity and there's not hacker spaces but similar like um facilities that you can contact as scientists at least in the research center in in Jülich to to get some help if you have a particular software problem and this is kind of a similar concept just not a single room where you can just go and meet but uh this is a definitely a good a good thing to to do and to be aware of yeah